cuarentena y espero que disfruten eh, mucho de esta presentación de hoy porque tenemos un eh, gran invitado al doctor André Mermut, que fue uno de los precursores de la cirugía no penetrante y me da mucho gusto que esté con nosotros y haga esta presentación que va a ser increíble, eh, estoy seguro. Él ha hecho el Research Fellowship en Glaucoma y UEITIS en Duhini Eye Institute y en la Universidad de Southern California en Los Ángeles. También hizo su Fellowship en Glaucoma en la Universidad de Cape Town en Sudáfrica. Eh, es un investigador eh, que como ven no para en el desarrollo de la nueva tecnología quirúrgica para lo que es glaucoma. Tiene mucho interés eh, quirúrgico en catarata también y tiene eh, más de 140 artículos publicados, que lo pueden ver en PacMed, y también autor de muchos libros y capítulos eh, de Glaucoma. Eh, estoy seguro pues, que, que van a aprovechar esta presentación eh, como yo, siempre lo he seguido eh, en toda mi, mi carrera de Glaucoma desde el inicio, y estoy muy feliz de tenerlo a We are very glad to have you here, Dr. Mahmoud, and to Thank accept you. to do a presentation with all of us. So thank you very much for accepting and welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. And I'm very happy to be with you. Now we are 100 people, I see. And that's nice yeah. to be uh, that uh, uh, all these people together. First, uh -huh. uh, yeah, I'm from Lausanne in Switzerland. I, there is a picture here from my hospital. Uh, here, this is Montfazi Clinique. Uh, I used to be in the university hospital, but now I'm in this private place. And uh, we have a very nice setup also with the Glaucoma Research Center, where we are developing new tools and uh, new techniques for glaucoma surgery with uh, Dr. Mansouri also and other people. So today, I'm going to speak about two subjects. So first we start with a deep sclerectomy. And uh, I want to talk about the surgical technique for people who are not used to it. And also to speak a little bit about mechanism of filtration. How does it work, uh, this uh, non-penetrating glaucoma surgery? So uh, the main principle is actually shown here. You have here a scheme and here a photography of a surgery. On the, the aim actually is to create this little membrane uh, called the trabeculodesmet membrane. Uh, why uh, was this, I mean, why did we do that? I mean, the, the man who had this idea was Kasnov and Koslov in, the, in, in Russia in the 80s. Uh, because the reason is with trabeculectomy, we are doing a hole and then we are covering the hole with a flap and all the resistance for the outflow actually is given inside the flap by putting some suture two or five or more sutures and we are creating some resistance to the outflow to avoid hypotony on the flap. Uh, with deep sclerectomy, uh, because the flap is not always uh, regular and uh, you know the first day we never know if the pressure will be zero or 30. So the idea was to create a stable resistance and that's why we are creating this membrane and the membrane here will create the post-op outflow resistance because this membrane if you do the correct dissection will always be the same and you see it here on the, the slide this is the membrane you know there is the Schlems canal here in a bit darker uh, line just behind you have the sterile spur, and this is the, the Schlem's canal, and then anteriorly you have the anterior trabeculum, which you see on the left side here, and then in the anterior part, you have the desmet membrane. And this window, uh, which is always the same size, usually four millimeters and one and a half millimeters, uh, will create an outflow resistance, which will be basically the same from one patient or the other. And that's why it's very interesting. It gives you a very good safety of the procedure. And then later, after two, three, six months, there will be some kind of fibrosis here also. And then the pressure will go up. Then we can actually open it by doing a little hole inside with the laser. And I'll show you uh, what we call gonia puncture. 
And then we are establishing a direct connection again between the anterior chamber and that intracellular blood. So we are calling it deep sclerectomy because under this first flap, we are actually removing part of the sclera, creating a space inside the sclera, which you can see here. This space here uh, will be created and we are getting an intrascleral filtering blood, not only the subconjunctural blood, but also intrascleral. And I'll show you more later. So the technique, uh, we regularly do a first flap, which is shown here, five millimeters by five millimeter. The depth is about 300 micron, one third of the total sterile thickness. Once this first flap is done, we are doing the second flap, which will be uh, the deep sclerectomy, and this is a bit smaller. I'm on purpose leaving a little step here. And that is, the reason for that is that when I have a perforation during surgery and there is a lot of flow, then I can close quite tightly the side to avoid a leak on the side and just leaving the aqueous flowing in the back part here. And so these two step here will allow me to close very tightly the flap if I need because of a perforation. So now the second flap should be very deep. And uh, you'll see on the video, but here I'm always, when I start my flap in the back, I'm always cutting, oh, sorry, I'm cutting down. No, that's not uh, the right slide, excuse me. I'm cutting down to the corey to know the total depth of the sclera. And then I will start that second horizontal dissection when I have reached the choroid, or, or here, yes, it's the CRE body, and then here is the choroid. The choroid is not dangerous to open it, you know. Uh, the choroid is very soft, and uh, you don't have bleeding, so you can just easily open the choroid here in the corner, and then go forward. Uh, and once you reach the canal, then you are very happy, but then you have to go further anterior to create your window. So this is the part where after you have opened Trans canal, you have to go further anterior. At that stage, I usually do a paracentesis for two reasons. One is to have an access to the anterior chamber in case of perforation of the membrane, and I have to inject some BSS in the chamber so I have an access uh, when the pressure is still a little bit elevated. And the second reason is to, by doing the paracentesis when the pressure is very elevated, I can reduce the pressure slightly. And this will um, reduce the risk of perforation because when we are doing this very difficult, I mean, very sensitive dissection here, uh, we might perforate. So to go further, there is a natural plane between the anterior trabeculum and the corneal stroma and then further anterior between the decimate membrane and the corneal stroma. To create this, we have to press gently with a knife. Here is a a ruby blade, but you can also use uh, a crescent blade or different knives. I mean, they, they should be round. Uh, and you press gently over this tissue, not going anteriorly, but going posteriorly, so to avoid penetration. And then slowly you can actually break those little adherence between the corner stroma and this uh, tissue. And then when you have created that space, you can actually cut on each, either, either side to really uh, go and go more anterior. And you can see here, I'm cutting on the side to go more anterior. I'll show you all this on a video just right after. When you reach the right position and have a nice window, so here the chamber is still not open. I have still have the desmet membrane and the trabeculum here. When you are, once you're happy, you can actually cut it. Uh, first, with a little cut here, you'll see with a, a knife, and then you can finish with a scissor. So these are the major principles for the dissection. Um, you have to be very careful when you're actually dissecting this part, not to perforate. Uh, so this is now a video showing the first cut, five by five, one third thickness for the first curl flap. You have to come quite anterior to about two millimeters into clear cornea. Yeah, I'm putting some mycomycin. Um, and now starting the second flap, leaving that little step on the side. Uh, and now see, I'm going to the choroid here. This is the choroid. And this will give me the total depth. I'm just maybe stopping here. It's important to see the choroid and then to go very horizontally 
And here, at the, when you are reaching the white part, which is sclerosis fur, first, in front of it, you can see here is the uh, Schlems canal. So now Schlems canal can be open from the side and from the other side, you can cut horizontally here, radially, to also expose the Schlems canal. Now Schlems canal is totally open, and now we gently press over Schlems canal, I mean, and the enter part to dissect between the enter trabeculum and later uh, the desmet membrane and opening on the side. Here it's ready. We can cut that deep sterile uh, tissue and then finish with the scissors. So here we have a nice trabecular desmet window or membrane. Now we are removing with this little forceps the inner wall of Schrems canal. This is the Juxta canila killer trabeculum. That is the site of the main resistance for the outflow in glaucoma. So uh, you can look at the forceps taking uh, this tissue. It is just the layer of uh, this trabeculum. Okay, you see it very nicely here. It's pigmented. And then that will increase your outflow uh, because you remove that major resistant part. Once that is finished, that's the end of the dissection. You can put an implant. Uh, this was an older video. I was putting the collagen. Now the collagen, which was sold by Star Surgical, is not anymore on the market. Now here I'm putting those sutures to close my flap. You don't need to put any tension here because the resistance to outflow, as I said before, is situated at the level of the membrane below here. The flap, you just put it back. It's I would say aesthetic, but there is no need to put any uh, resistance there. And I think we are almost done here. And then we close the conjunctiva. This closure should be tight like an intravitilectomy, that's because you don't want a leak after surgery. Here is the way we were putting the collagen later, uh, putting actually inside uh, to enhance. And the idea was to bring some accurate also into the subcoidal space. And I don't have a video here, but uh, I see that uh, uh, Jordi Loscos is with us. Jordi Loscos from Barcelona, they developed the Esnoffer implant, and that is what I'm using now because I don't have any more the, the collagen. And the Esnoffer, you do just a little uh, cut here, and you put the implant in the subcortical space in the back, and then you fold it to have one part in the intrascular bleb and the other part in the subcroidal space. And that's a very nice implant I'm using now since I don't have the collagen anymore. The other implant I'm using is also uh, the ILA-Flow. And that is an injection of ILA-Flow. It's a very dense hyaluronic acid. It's reticulated hyaluronic acid called ILA-Flow. And that's very nice because you can put it everywhere. You, you fill your space as you see here on the video. And then the next day, interestingly, it's becoming solid. So it really fills the space. And that is very interesting if you have a perforation. And I'll show you here. See here, I have a little perforation of the desmet uh, window. And I have put a little bit of provisc into the anterior chamber to keep my chamber. So that is a little bit of provisc uh, prolapse here. And that, now I'm going to put uh, ILA flow to fill the space and give some resistance. Otherwise, the pressure will be too low the next day because then, then the resistance of the membrane is not very high. So now I'm putting my ILA flow, very sticky and very hard. And then I will put, depends the size of my perforation. If I have a big perforation with an iris prolapse, then I may have to do a neurodectomy. And then I usually put uh, here I put, sorry, uh, I'm going to that place. Excuse me, here, here. I just want to stop. So here I just put two sutures and I re-inject ILAFO to be sure that it's full uh, because that has very small perforation. But if I have a big perforation, I, I do the new redectomy, then I would put more suture. I would put two sutures on the side here, an X-shaped suture, one more on this side, and then one more in the back. So I put basically eight sutures and then put again ILA flow. That is when I have a big opening and that works very well. Uh, then the pressure will be good because the ILA flow will give you just the resistance you need 
to avoid hypothermia. Um, now, I'm, I like very much the subcoroidal uh, filtration. So I done a series where I was doing a little hole here and injecting the ILA flow uh, in the subcoroidal space. And this gives us an extra two millimeters less IOP in the post operative period. And that's why Jordi Loscos developed also the SNOPER by putting one of the arm inside the subcoroidal space. I think it's very important, but then you get an extra outflow mechanism in your deep strike to me as technique. Here you can see uh, when we are injecting the ELA flow under the subcoroidal space, you know, it's here, the, the, the black, what you see that hypogenicity is actually ELA flow uh, between the serial body and the sclera. And this will give you really an extra blade. So you have the subconjunctival blade, which you can see here. You have the intrastural blade, which is seen here, and the subcroidal blade. So you have three blades. And this will give you really low pressure in the post-operative period. In our experience, we saw that after two years, this blade had a tendency to actually disappear. Uh, and the only uh, the intrastural blade. Uh, stays and the subcontractor blab often stays also. Now I want to show you a few tricks. See here, I'm stopping the video. Uh, I was much too super, I didn't go down enough here. I didn't show the choroid. So I started my horizontal second plane too superficially. And you can think that this is stem channel, but it's not stem channel. I, I'm too much, too high. And if I continue like this, I will probably have a little bit of percolation and maybe the pressure the next day will be 20 if it was 25 before, but it won't be five uh, because that it's not a correct dissection. So you really have to go down more and you have to open Schlem's canal. So now having realized that I'm too superficial, I will have to cut more and I'm using a, a different knife and I'm opening Schlem's canal here to be on the right plane to be able then to dissect my trabecular desmet window. And that's very important because if you don't open on the right plane, the dissectomy will not function correctly and the pressure will be too elevated. It will also be very difficult to do a gonia puncture if you leave the, all, all this tissue, as you see the white tissue here. You really have to open stem scanner. That's a very important step. And many of the first publication of detrectomy then in the 90s and early 2000s uh, showed not very good results with detrectomy because those, a lot of those surgeons did not open correctly, uh, were not on the right plane. Another problem is that this is another case which was operated from somebody else. I'm just stopping here. This was the original dissection done by a, a colleague. And the pressure was okay. The first week or two, the pressure was 10, 15, but then it went up again to 20. And the patient was sent to me. Uh, and then I, I decided to, because I did the gonioscopy could not, and could not see the window. So we went and opened again the first flap and realized that the dissection was not done, not done enough anteriorly. You know, here, only Schlem's canal has been open, but really, you really have to open also to remove the this white corneal tissue to uh, open the full window. And that's very important to continue. And so I then we took that case and tried to re-dissect with a uh, forceps and knife to expose totally the trabecular desmetic window, which will come here. And again, this is very important. You can see that now Aquas is starting to flow, but you have to go one more millimeters anteriorly. It's very important. I'm just showing you one of my latest uh, dissection. And I don't have any more fancy tool because I became poor, you know, with the coronavirus. <laughs> so I'm using uh, ordinary uh, question blade and it works very well. Uh -huh. I'm not opening, I mean, uh, I just go like to do a small incision cataract surgery, uh, do my first flap and it gives you very regular flap as you can see here. Uh, now I'm doing my second flap here, also with the same knife. I'm now opening 
Schrems canal, I can see here, uh, by cutting radially, uh, uh, delimitating the Schrems canal, then you can cut horizontally to really open it totally. So you see that's uh, now important to really open it well by doing those radial cuts. But now I just did, I didn't show, but I, I was doing my paracentesis. And now to continue, I'm using this very nice uh, Grish Arbor uh, spatula uh, or knife, which was designed by Stegman in South Africa. And this is very precise to do that little uh, dissection and to really remove all the adherence between the corner stroma and the anterior trabeculum and then the desmet uh, membrane. So this is, you should go very slowly. Don't take your time not to perforate, you know, by cutting uh, uh, on the side to expose that window correctly. And go third, really enough, I, I like to do about two millimeters of, um, of, of, of window, you know, from here to here, almost two millimeters. So here you can see the Schlems canal, and then you have the anterior trabeculum, which is a bit gray from here to here. And from this line, which actually corresponds to Schwalbe's line, then you have the desmet uh, membrane, which is totally transparent. And the filtration usually occurs at that level, at the anterior trabeculum, because it's very thin and it has not been damaged by glaucoma. The damage is at, at the level of the trabeculum here. Um, so just want to speak about a little bit the mechanism. I just look at the time because uh, I think, yeah, I have to go a bit further, uh, quicker. Um, the filtration, so the main advantage of this me are the two things. One is that membrane. The membrane is important because it will give you that resistance and uh, give the good pressure the first day, which should be between five and 10. And then you get different way of aqueous resorption. If you do a trial, you get only the subconjunctural bleb, but with the deep system, you get the subconjunctural bleb on the top here. Uh, it's here. Then you get the intrascleral bleb, which is here on the UVM image. And then you have an, a subcoidal bleb down here. And you also have some fluid going through the Schrems canal, especially if you do a viscoanalostomy by injecting some viscous in Schrems canal, you can even have a force a four mechanism of aqueous outflow. First, to show you a uh, histology of a trabecular desmet membrane. Here is the posterior trabeculum, which is the pigmented trabeculum in the gonioscopy. The anterior trabeculum here, the non pigmented Schwalbe's line, and then the desmet. Uh, membrane. And this is important to this section. I show you here also putting blue, you can see that there is filtration through the, this part, the anterior trabeculum. But if when you remove the inner wall, then you put again blue and see even more filtration uh, after the total dissection. And this is very important to remove because that's the size of the main resistance. And I show you just those electronic Microscopy is a normal endothelium of Schrems canal with the little vacuoles opening here, bringing the active mechanism of aqueous outflow. And here on the bottom, you can see uh, a membrane after glaucoma surgery on a glaucomatous eye. There are no more vacuoles, no more, those cells are dead. And that is glaucoma. And that they have to remove. And also to show you a few slides on the intrastellar blood, this, that, that was done on rabbits. This is before surgery. You can see that we are injecting blue, shows you where the aqueous is flowing. So it's flowing through the trabeculum here into Schlem's canal, but also in the rabbit, you have a very important uvascular outflow in the cell body and the iris. And then we are putting here a collagen implant, and that's after one month. You can see that the water flows through that space, as well as the uvascular outflow. After three months, you can see the start of new vessels, and these are the vessels, drainage vessels, which are starting to be built inside the sclera. And after nine months, you can see that we have a lot of blue calamine aqueous flowing inside the sclera, and all those new drainage vessels uh, taking place inside the sclera. And we are supposed that in human, we get the same phenomenon uh, with the intrascleral blood uh, working there where you remove your, your sclera. Again, this is the, the normal eye before surgery, no intrascleral vessel, and here a lot of intrascleral vessel uh, showing the intrascleral bleb. We can actually see it 
in 92% if we do UVM post-operatively. Uh, the subconjunctival bleed is not seen always. We see it actually clinically in 50% of cases because so often they are very diffuse. But if you do UVM, you can find that subconjunctival bleed here. And the subcorridor uh, drainage uh, can be observed in about 50% of UVM. I think you can see it here and also see it here. To conclude, uh, I think defectomy is a very safe operation because creating that trabeculosis membrane gives you that safety because the first day you know that your pressure will be always between 10, uh, 5 and 10, 12, but never 30, never zero. So only if you're perforated, then it's almost like a trap and then you have to close the tight to your flap. But then of course it's much less predictable, but if you have a nice membrane, it's very predictable. That really gives you a good safety of the surgery, a good reproducibility. And then the other advantage is to, that you're creating, you're creating actually four ways of aqueous drainage, not only one like in trabeculation, but you have also your scler uh, intrascleral space, your subconjunctival bled, your subcorridor space, and Schlem's canal. And all those different ways of aqueous resorption will definitely reduce the size of your subconjunctival bleb. So the blebs are very subtle, they're not so big like in trabeculectomy. And it's, I think it's very important because the patient will feel much more comfortable. Uh, they don't have those dry eye syndrome. And also at the long term, you can avoid a lot of late hypotony when the bleb is very thin and there's a the pressure of two or less. Or you can also avoid some of the late end of palmitis when you have leaks late on, on a later time. And this, you cannot avoid 100%, but you can avoid much less of those late complications. And this is the end of deep screctomy, the technique and the mechanism. Thank you. I don't know if you want Thank you to ask questions now or later. Yes. Yes, we can do the questions uh, now that is fresh. So okay. when, when do you have a perforation that you show some videos and actually amazing videos, uh, do you transform your surgery to a uh, trabeculectomy? Because I, I heard that you do like an iridectomy, but you didn't do the punch. Um, yeah, no, because if you perforate, if it's a very small perforation, and your enter chamber can stay normal or you can put some viscoelastic mm -hmm. into the chamber, then you don't need to do an iridectomy. But sometimes if a big perforation, then the iris will can come out and then you definitely have to do also an iridectomy because the iris is there. And then it's a kind of a combination between a deep screctomy and a trabeculectomy. At least it's what I call a penetrating deep screctomy. Uh, okay. Then you have the advantage of this factor is still because you still will get your intrastural blood, and that's what I do. I mean, you know, when I'm I'm working a lot with my foundation in India and in Africa, mm -hmm. and in those countries, and I'm sure there are places in in South America where you have the same problem with patients not coming for follow-ups because they are living far away in the jungle. Yes, um, I'm sure. I mean, in your country or in Brazil, it's the problem. It's 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 it can happen. And uh, if I'm mm -hmm. working in those conditions, I wouldn't do a deep screctomy. I directly, I'm on purpose, I'm perforating. When I'm working in Africa, I'm perforating every case. And I'm doing a new iridectomy, I'm closing my flap with eight sutures. I do a penetrating deep screctomy. And this gives ah. a very good result. We have done 50 cases in Congo five years ago. And we just published the result. Uh, this 50 case, and they're all black patient difficult cases with a very high scarring response. They are all doing fine. I tell you that the mean pressure is 12 in the group with no medication. And it's very interesting. So if you are working, if you're listening to the talk and you're working in a place where patients are not coming for follow-up visit, if you don't have a YAG laser, because you need to have a YAG laser uh, if you do that's this, the you yeah. do the gonia puncture. Uh -huh. so if you don't have this, that's not a problem. Just do uh, the deep plus iridectomy, and you put your eight oh. on the flap. 
and then you get very good result. Wow, nice tip, very good tip. So yeah. uh, there's, a, there's another question. Uh, what implant do you prefer? If it's the heel flow, the collagen, or the snooper? Do you have experience <laughs> with that too? Yeah, uh, I've experienced with all the tubes, uh, but uh, until recently, my, my preferred was the, the collagen, but it's not anymore. You cannot find anymore the collagen because the star is not using, I mean, producing it anymore. So now I'm using mm -hmm. Ilaflow and Snooper. Uh, if I have no perforation, I put the Snooper because it's a nice uh, uh, implant. And uh, I mean, Jordi Lascaux, who is the inventor, is with us huh, today, so I'm very happy. Uh, and uh, he has done this very interesting invention and we have done together uh, the study and it shows good results. And if I have a perforation, uh, small or big, then I use Ilaflow because the Ilaflow allows to really fill the space nicely and create more resistance uh, postoperatively. So these are my two main uh, implants. I don't think there are many more. I mean, there was at one stage the T flux done by Zeiss, but I don't think it's anymore on the market. Mm. Okay, so there's a question that if you are using this kind of supracoroidal implants like routinely in every of your surgeries? Yeah, if I put, I like because I think the subcoroidal flow is also a good way to it, you know, it enhance the uvascular outflow. And so I'm using it all the time, you know, by perforating a little bit. So if, if I put Ilaflow, the Ilaflow will go there, as I showed on the video. And if you put the Snooper, you also, I mean, are cutting the, 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 the sclera. And also when I was using the collagen, I was, I was on purpose cutting uh, the, 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 the last layer of, of, of the sclera to actually expose the, the, the corridor space. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's other question that is, is very interesting too, because uh, we had experience with class here, like many cases, and we got to do a lot of gonopuncture. So what is your percentage of gonopuncture after uh, this kind of surgeries in, in your hands? Yeah, we published 80%. So I think it's, it's very high. I mean, uh, almost every patient's uh, have to do have a gonopuncture view because with time the membrane has a tendency to get very uh, thicker and less uh, uh, permeable. So I think gonopuncture is part of your treatment if you do deep tracheotomy uh, because if the pressure as soon as the pressure goes more than twelve, I do the gonopuncture. Uh -huh. Don't do it too early because if you do it early, I would say in the first two months, then you have a high risk of hypotony and pressure of oh, zero. Okay. That's why wait a little bit before doing your gonopuncture with the laser. If you do class, uh, uh, you know, I was the first uh, user of class a uh, long time ago. It's a nice method uh, if you're afraid to do manual deep tractomy, I mean, almost automatic deep tractomy, but you're not open yeah. the same because um, as soon as you reach the decimate uh, membrane, it will perforate. And then, so you have actually, basically you have to open Schrems canal and a little bit anterior to it, but uh, you cannot go really much anterior, but it works nice because the class stem uh -huh. actually you go a little bit more deep probably than if you do just simple manual uh, deep tracheotomy. But you still Perfect. need to do gonopuncture and then it's more difficult because you didn't expose the decimal window. You're just exposing Schrems canal, basically. Yeah. Yeah, so your recommendations, uh, to be clear here, is the gonopuncture after two months, right, of the surgery? More than two months, yeah, but you can do it after More than two months. five years and it works still, it still works. <laughs> yes. yes, that's true. And yeah. it's because also all, their, all the four filtrations that you said before, right? It's very yeah. different than the trap, uh, trabeculectomy. No bleb, no bleb, but the good pressure. That means your intrascular bleb or your sweep corridor flow is functioning. So do you combine this kind of surgery also with FACO? Yes, I do probably more than half of my case are combined surgery. So what I do, I do my deep tractomy at 12 o'clock on the top 
and I do my FECO on the side. I'm always doing my FECO uh, temporarily and uh, using the right hand for the right eyes and left hand for the left eyes. Uh, so, and usually what I do, I do my first flap when the eye is still with a good pressure. Then I do my FECO before doing my second flap because if you do your second flap and you do uh, and already expose your membrane, if you do the phaco later, you may break the membrane with the pressure of the phaco. So I do my phaco before doing the second flap. And then when I finish my phaco and I put my implant, uh, then I come back and do the second uh, flap and the deep track. Oh, okay. Okay. Perfect. And, and I saw you also that at the end of your surgery, you put like only two sutures or you put more? No, I even didn't put any suture at one stage. Ah, there, there is one of our yeah. colleague, uh, uh, Paleta, in uh, in Brazil. Uh -huh. uh, he doesn't. Ah, oh, yes, suture. yes. And uh, but I, I don't like because sometimes I get hypotony if I don't put suture, uh, especially if you do a goniopuncture and when there is no. So I usually put just two suture to have my flap where it should be. Uh, mm -hmm. And I put more suture if I have a perforation, of course. And the last question is, uh, do you put uh, mitomycin in all your surgeries? Yeah, basically I put mitomycin in almost every case. Um, on the video I showed you, I didn't show well how I do today. No, no. Today, <laughs> I open my conjunctiva and put three, uh -huh. three big sponge, about five to six millimeters long sponge with mitomycin below the conjunctiva and going really back uh, uh, almost into the orbit and leave it there for two uh -huh. minutes and then during this uh -huh. two minutes I do my first flap then I remove them and then I also put a little square of mitomycin when I finish my second flap on the deep sclerectomy I, I put uh, just I touch with a sponge of mitomycin so I, I have two two times I put mitomycin and I do that in every case it's just a routine in my operation. Uh -huh. and, and what is your concentration? 0.02%. And usually two minutes, it can be three minutes sometimes. No, it's not very important, I think. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, we solved all the, the questions. And yeah, doctor, you can share your next presentation. Okay, I'm, yeah, do, do you see my next presentation now? Uh, yeah. It's here. Do, do you see it? No, not yet. Because it's on my, my screen, but you don't see it, so I have to share my... Uh, screen, yeah. Yeah, I, but why is it not sharing? I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, if, yeah, share the screen. I hope it will. Now, do you see it? Perfect. Yes, I can see it. Okay, yeah. so now I can start my talk on the eye watch. Eye watch. Thanks. Uh, maybe I, I'll be a little bit more quick because I think I took some too much time huh, with this factor. Me, so the eye no, watch, don't worry, don't worry. It's, it's a free time, don't worry. I can even go a little bit further if we need. Okay. So the eyewash is, is the first, the world first adjustable drainage system. Uh, it's a system like a Barfel tube, a Molteno tube, or a Hachmet tube. And uh, if you look in the literature, all, almost, I mean, already more than 20 years ago, 22 years ago in the British Journal of Ophthalmology, uh, Lim uh, wrote, uh, said that glaucoma filtering surgery, uh, I, I mean, it's a bit difficult because when you put the, the tubes, uh, there are too many complications, unfortunately. And uh, I was also saying that, uh, you know, existing glaucoma drainage devices uh, have problems with poor flow control. You know, they are often flowing too much at the beginning and they are hypotony and they, they, then they don't flow enough and then they may have complications with the cornea. This is just to show you the TVT study. TVT, which is tube versus, I mean, versus trabeculectomy study, 
the three-year follow-up, so that the qualified that meaning the pressure uh, with or without medication was better with TRAB, and the complete success with no medication are also better with TRABs, but the complication rate was much higher with trabeculectomy compared with the tube. So in, in the States, in America and in North America, most of our colleagues now are using the drainage devices like Barfeld or Ahmed and don't do much, many trabeculectomies due to those complications. But the tubes still are coming with their own complications. And um, it comes with, uh, you know, you have to put a ligature. I don't know if you can see, but I, I'm, I have my, um, this one. Uh, the cursor? Yes, it can see your, your mouse. Yeah, you can see the mouse, huh? Yeah. So yes. often, uh, you know, to avoid the early hypotony, uh, usually we put a suture on the tube with a vicarious suture so that it will resolve later. We can also can put a suture inside the tube and remove it later. That needs a second operation. Uh, so there are a lot of tricks, you know, to do, uh, but it's not so easy. And we have to re-intervene to remove the sutures. Uh, uh, and then, so the predictability of tube surgery is not that great. It's like with trabeculectomy compared to deep strectomy. And the other problem with tube is the rate of corneal damages about 15% uh, of the patient having a tube have to have a corneal graft after five years. And this has, has been published in several papers. Now for the, 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 the pressure control with the Ahmed valve, it's a little bit better because you have a valve, a so-called valve put in the system, which is not really a valve because a valve will open when the pressure goes up and will close again when the pressure comes low. The Ahmed valve has been studied uh, on a bench uh, and show that it doesn't really close. It opens at a certain pressure, about 10. But then when the pressure comes down, the valve doesn't close again. So it's not a real, a real valve. And uh, so we, again, have the same problem with hypotony and sometimes chor choroidal detachment if you have very high pressure at the beginning. And the same problem with the cornea also because the tube is quite big. So the iWatch system was, I mean, done here in Lausanne. Now we started to do it about 10 years ago. Uh, I went to the technical school, uh, which is part of the Federal University here in Lausanne, uh, where the very good department of uh, microtechnology. And I talked to the professor saying, why can't we do a system where we can do like a water tab in the eye, we can actually open or close to really regulate nicely the flow after uh, tube surgery. And so that's what we did. Uh, so here we have a first part, we see that water tap system, which is then we, we can actually open and close. And then it's connected to a tube and then a plate like the Barfeld or the Ahmed. But here we can connect and then we can actually with the iWatch pen, here we have a little compass so we can know uh, what is the aperture of the same, we can open it from zero to six, but we'll see it more uh, on, on a video after. And uh, then you can actually, on the other side of the pen, you have a little magnet and you can turn and close or open your system. The other advantage is the little pipe, the tube going inside the chamber, which is here, is much smaller than a Barfeld or a Ahmed tube. And that, and it's also rigid. So it will prevent the corneal damage. And that was the aim, so to prevent corneal damage, to prevent hypotony, and we also redesigned the plate here, which is much thinner, in, it's less wide, so it doesn't go under the uh, rectus muscles. And because if you put a big bar felt, you also have often strabismus problem and patient complaining of double vision. So with this new plate, we are also avoiding the double vision problem. So basically you can avoid almost all the completion of the regular uh, tube surgery. And I will show you a video. Yeah, so the, this is the iWatch for the flow resistance control. Then you have, that will avoid hypotony and uh, give you good pressure. The little nozzle, the tube is much smaller 
and it's rigid that will avoid the corneal problem. Uh, and then the eye plate is called here, uh, is very soft and less wide, so it will avoid strabismus. Uh, how it's built? So I just show you the system. So you have a, the small tube comes into the system and there is a silicone, very thin tube going around a wheel. I can see it come and then comes out in the back. This wheel is asymmetric and in the center you have a magnet so you can actually turn it uh, because you have this ball bearing system. These are small ruby. It's very easy to turn this wheel using the magnet and the wheel being uh, asymmetric, when you turn it, it will come and crash against the tube and it will close it and it will turn against the, the clock, clock anti-clockwise, then you can again open it because it will not crash anymore the tube. And uh, yeah, this is the, uh, the plate, it looks almost like the bar cell, but it goes further back and it's less wide. And there is a 200 millimeter square and a 300 millimeter square can choose uh, according to the need of uh, your pressure. So here is a video. Uh, you can the eye watch system is the world's first adjustable glaucoma drainage shunt. It is designed to drain aqueous humor efficiently while allowing for an atraumatic adjustment of intraocular pressure according to each patient's needs. The system consists of the eye watch flow adjustment device connected in series to the eye plate. The fluidic resistance of the iWatch device can be adjusted non-invasively by rotating its internal magnetic disc using an external control unit. The rotation of the magnetic disc around its eccentric axis allows for compression or decompression of the drainage tube, thus acting like an adjustable faucet. Okay. Now I'm showing you a video. How, how do we put that? So we are opening the conjunctiva and exposing the, uh, the orbit space, putting the plate there. We, I like to put 12 to 15 millimeter between my the limbus and the suture. You know, here it's 13 millimeter. So we're even putting more 15. And so then I put two sutures to hold the plate. So very posture, more posture than may, usually what we do with the bar cell. So we don't touch also the muscle. And this is the same, I mean, technology as for a bar field. Now I put in here the design to show where the eye wash will go. And I'm actually removing about half of the scleral thickness to, uh, because the eye, the eye wash is about 500 micron thick. So I like to put it really inside the sclera so it doesn't flash outside. Uh, here we are using regular crescent blade to uh, remove this part of the sclera. I like to put an anti-chamber maintainer so that will keep a regular pressure. And then we are entering the chamber with a 26 gauge needle, uh, being very close to the iris to avoid to touch the endothelium. And then we are inserting the eye watch and putting it in place, checking with the gonioscope that the eye watch is well positioned. Then we're putting two suture. I like to go anterior by, by, because by closing my suture, I will actually press the implant towards the, the limbus. Then we're checking the opening, so that's totally open. And now I'm going to close it with the magnet on the other side of the device. I like turning around clockwise to the six here. And we're checking, it's six, so it's ready. If it's not six, then we can put more. And now we're going to connect this iWatch system, uh, cutting the little tube and connect it to the eye plate in the back here. That's very easy to do, just put it in and it holds by itself. And then we are putting a tutoplast graph to protect uh, the system before closing the conjunctiva. So it's not a very difficult surgery. Uh, it's quite elegant because uh, it's clean. And of course, if you do it on a, uh, a patient with several previous operations, it's a bit more difficult because they have scar. Now here I'm just checking with the gonioscope at the end to be sure that the tube is placed correctly.
Uh, if, uh, yeah, if you do it in a patient with a lot of surgery before, of course, it's a bit more difficult to dissect the conjunctiva and, and sometimes to close it. But uh, you can we even put it as a first attempt in some patients. It's very easy surgery. So this is the, the device which allows us to regulate. So here the, the compass showing the, uh, you, you are aiming the little arrow here towards the, the little tube, and then you can see uh, if it's open or not from zero to six. And then if you want to change, you just take, use the, the magnet on the right side here, and then you can turn uh, through the conjunctiva, you can open it or close it. I will show you how we do it. This is the patient. So now we are measuring. Here you can see how it works. We are turning, but we press and close. Now it's closed, 5.5. Uh, and then you can reopen it if you need, because the pressure is too elevated. And now here it's 2 or 1.5. And you can play around with the system, open or close. And this, of course, in the follow-up is very interesting. So during surgery, we always close it because often we have a small leak around the tube, so the pressure is good the first day, but then when the pressure goes up again, uh, it's very easy to reopen. And I'll show you uh, how it goes. Here is an example. Uh, at the end of surgery, we close it to six. The pressure comes down the post first post-operative day. Then slowly the pressure will go up again. Then we are turning, opening to position four, and then the pressure will come down. But then it will go up a few days later, and then we will open it and get a bit more, put it on position one, and then it will come down and stay down for some time. Uh, and then uh, it's a bit too low, and that, then we can close it again. So we decide to go to two, and the pressure goes up again. And when it's up, then we are going to open it a bit more. And because that's after one month, usually we can open it totally open to zero. And then the pressure usually is stable. Between the first month and the six months, we still have uh, the what I call the cystic phase. When the water goes into the orbital space, it builds um, kind of a wall there. And then, uh, Usually we treat the patient with uh, up because that's the easiest way, one drop of up in the morning to reduce the production of water. This will really stop that cystic phase. And usually after six months, we can stop the up. But usually in most of our case, between the first and the six months, we put, we give some beta blocker, uh, aqueous suppressant to avoid the cystic phase. And then the pressure is regulated. Uh, the iWatch was, of course, started by us in Lausanne. Uh, the first case was done five years ago, uh, but then uh, quickly we asked some colleagues around the world to help us to do a multi-central study. So we have a, a Dr. Kirchner in Zurich who did a study. We have Dr. Chavez in Spain, in Alicante, Dr. O and Dr. Lim in London and Manchester in England and uh, Professor Derotakis and uh, in Thessaloniki, uh, uh, did also some cases. And uh, so now we have some results and then I can show you the IOP results after three years of follow-up. The mean pressure before surgery was 26. It came down to nine the first week. And you can see that due to the good regulation, the pressure came slowly up we have that cystic phase is usually, is usually here. And then we have a really flat phase uh, after six months, one or two years, with a mean pressure between 11 and 12. Very nicely regulated. We had no case above 18 actually in our series. So no case of hypertony because we could close the system when we needed. Uh, we have a 90% success rate, on, uh, which is qualified, meaning with or without medication after three years, and almost 40% of complete success, meaning no medication at all. Uh, we did a comparative study with Barfeld, and you can see that with the eyewash pressure is much lower, even on the long term, we are still lower of about two millimeters of mercury compared to the Barfeld, and Ahmed is even higher. Uh, the number of medication comparing with the Barfeld you know, the iWatch needs less medication 
on the long term, and I don't have any explanation because the Barfel plate is basically the same as our plate, uh, but maybe due to the good regulation after the surgery, we get maybe less inflammation. I, I don't have a really, a really good explanation to give, to explain you why it's better than the Barfel, but it is definitely you have lower pressure and a lower need of medication compared to the Barfel. And uh, Dr. Knishat in Zurich uh, did a study comparing iWatch with Ahmed and showed even bigger difference, you know, the Ahmed uh, at 58% success compared to 90 with the iWatch and complete success was 50 versus 40. So that was a bit better here. Um, in terms of complication, Ahmed has many more complications than the iWatch. And I can see that the pressure, the Ahmed are the dark uh, dots. You can see that in the follow-up, many patients had still pressure between 40 or 30 and 20. And see them here. Whereas in the iWatch, there was no pressure above 20. So, uh, just one case here and here and of 19, but basically all the pressure were in the good range. This shows you the Barfeld or the Ahmed implant in the antrum. It's a big implant, and it's also a mobile implant. So it's not rigid, and you can touch the endothelium. That's why uh, uh, we have about, uh, in Ahmed, 12% of corneal endothelial cell loss, and 12% in the Barfeld. And with the Iowa system, because it's rigid, uh, we have only 5% loss uh, of the endothelial cell, which is the same as we get in phaco emulsification. So basically not much loss of the cells of the cornea. Uh, this is an in interesting case. It was a patient who at one stage, I couldn't put during the study, uh, we were limited in the number of iWatch that we had. So I was still putting some bar cell and this patient had a Barfeld implant put in and had an hypotonia, a chronic hypotonia, and then it had a corridor detachment and we did the drainage and then we injected uh, viscoelastic here and we uh, put also this elastic here, but then the pressure came down again to two or three. So that, then we, what we did, we, did, we actually put an eye watch and connected the eye watch to the Barfeld tube and then the pressure went up then we open the, the iWAT slowly and then came down and then it again and up again. But at the long term, the pressure stabilized around 10. So it actually saved this bar fell with hypotony due to a secondary iWAT positioning. What about MRI scan? Uh, if you have an iWAT, you have a magnet, so your image of the eye will be disturbed. So you don't get a good image with the, the iWAT will yeah, do that. Uh, the other thing is that the iWatch is not dangerous. It, you can do an MRI scan, even if you have the magnet, but it just, I mean, the, the, it's not dangerous. Um, you can use it up to uh, three Tesla uh, instruments with no problem. But then after you have done an MRI scan in a patient, you have to check your opening of the iWatch because it can actually move a uh, little bit the opening of your system. So we always tell the patient, if you do MRI, come and we'll check and readjust your uh, system. What about airport uh, scans? Uh, there are total security because the magnet, uh, magnet piece you have in airport control is not very strong and doesn't move. Uh, we've tried all this uh, and it's very safe. In daily situations, sometimes people are living with magnets in the kitchen, you know, I have on the fridge, little magnets, and these are quite strong magnets sometimes. So we tell our patient, don't put magnets near your face, otherwise it could sometimes, if it comes to two to three millimeters from the eye, uh, could actually change your aperture of the system. So that's basically what I want to tell you about this new system, which is very safe and very easy to put. And I, I think it will really probably replace partially uh, our way to operate uh, a difficult case of glaucoma, or even maybe now we're going to start a study as a first intention, because we have so little complications and good results with the iWatch system that we want to even use it as a first surgery in our glaucoma test patient. 
we're going to start soon and start recomparing trabeculectomy and eye wash surgery. I have put here my email, so if you have any question uh, concerning, you know, a deep trachotomy or eye watch, you can send me a message. I'm going to stop my, uh, thank you very much for listening to me, but very long, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was amazing and very interesting. I'm sure uh, blow the mind of everyone with this eye watch that also for me is, is the first time that I, I see something like this. So uh, we're going to start with the questions now, Dr. Mahmoud. Okay. It's okay? Perfect. Sure. So I, I saw that when you put a drainage device, uh, you make like a limbal base. Are you use the limbal base to all your drainage devices? Yeah, I usually open the conch, uh, not at the limbus, a, a little bit further back, like two, three millimeters. So I do my suture so that it's more comfortable for the patients. But if you open on the limbus, then patients are feeling that there is a cornea sensitivity. So by putting uh -huh. the suture like three, four millimeters further back, first you see better your posterior dissection, and then you do your running suture and it's almost uh, not sensitive to the patient. Comfortable. Oh, perfect. Um, I saw that also you remove part of the sclera. Uh, I think is, is that for avoiding uh, erosion? Yes. Because you put a patch, but it, when you exactly. remove that, I think it's more flatter. So you know, this, for that this reason? technique has been evolving over a few months, even a few years. Uh, first, I did a big scleral flap and put my, my system inside, but the flap was seven millimeters by seven, and then it used to necrose, and then I lost my flap. So then I just put tutoplast to cover the system, but then there was like a bleb, and uh, with the lead movement, uh, we had erosion. So then I started to dissect, actually, and remove a part of the sclera corresponding to the exactly the shape of the, the eye watch. And now I'm removing uh -huh. about 500 micron, which is the, the, the depth of the eye watch system. And then I'm still covering it with tutoplast because if you just put conjunctiva, it may be too thin for some patients. So I like to put uh -huh. tutoplast to really cover it uh, carefully. And so by doing so, I don't have any more erosion. Ah, perfect. So that was the, the next question. Uh, what is your percentage of erosion with this eye watch? It happened a few times when I didn't put, I mean, inside the sclera. So at the beginning, I had probably, we did more than 100 cases now, and I, I had probably three to four cases at the beginning. But now that I'm using that, that technique I have doing now, I don't have any more erosion. And in the worst case, if you have an erosion, of course, you have to reoperate quickly because there is a risk of uh, infection. We never had any yes. infection, but I mean, there is that, that risk. And uh, in any uh -huh. case of Aaron, I did took the patient back to theater uh, and cover it again uh, with some tutoplast. Perfect. And do you use any mitomycin in your no. drainage devices? No, I don't do it because, uh, um, well, it's not actually proposed, you know, in any type of tube. I mean, people tried to put mitomycin in the orbit with tube surgery, but it never really showed an advantage or uh, better results. And um, so now we don't put it and our results are strangely good, you know? I mean, pressure, mean pressure is 12, which is what you want uh, in mm -hmm. the surgery. So I, I think it's, a, what do you prefer in a drainage device, like non-bulb or bulb in your cases? No, I mean, I like the eyewash because I, I tell you, it really gives you better results because uh, you have a totally safe su surgery and uh, yeah. you can regulate. There's no, almost no, no, no complication. Yeah. So that's why I'm now I'm only, we just got the C mark. That means, because before it was just in, we could use it only in the study. So it was limited in number. Now we got the C mark for that uh, device. So now I'm basically using it for every patient. I feel it needs a tube. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. So let's see one question. Uh, ah, okay. 
So, ah, what, uh, what is your number of the needle that you use to enter the anterior chamber? It's a 26G. 26G. Yeah. And that's exactly the size uh, of the tube, so it will be watertight. Ah, okay. Okay, perfect. So there's a question about the iWatch. In, it's now available commercially to, to buy it? Yes, uh, you can, you know, you, you check, uh, yes, Rion Medical is written on top here. Rion Medical is a small startup company here in Lausanne, which was done by the professor of uh, technology. And so they are producing now the device and you can buy it there. So you go on, on internet and you, you type uh, Rion or iWatch and you will find their uh, email address. You can actually order uh, the device. Perfect. Mirel, do you have any question to Dr. Mermud? Hi, doctor. Yes. Um, in your hands, doctor, how much time do you require to do this surgery? Is it much longer that, than a normal uh, implant? No, actually it's not. That, yeah, well, if you start, you know, I, would, I had a colleague did his first case yesterday. Uh, it took him one hour. But uh, now if I have an easy case, it takes me half an hour, so 30 minutes. And if it's a difficult case, it takes 40 minutes. Okay, I still have a question from the audience. Um, when you have a thin scleral patient, do you recommend mm -hmm. this implant or maybe um, because you have to do the, um, the little sclerectomy to put yes, the implant? I understand. That's a good question. <laughs> if you're really a very thin uh, sclera, it might be a problem. And, uh, but even if you put a Barfeld or an Ahmed tube, you have the same problem because the, uh, I'm usually also uh, uh, putting my Barfeld or Ahmed tube inside the sclera uh, to avoid the erosion later. Uh, but you can put mm -hmm. an eye watch and then put a double, double layer of uh, tetoplast and I, then I think it's still safe. I can still remove, even in thin sclera, you can still remove uh, at least half of the, of, the, of, of the sclera you have and then you, you, you're mm -hmm. gaining something. Perfect. And you always uh, oh. use tutoplast or maybe a scleral patch? No, you can use scleral patch also because tutoplast is not available mm -hmm. for people who don't know tutoplast. Tutoplast actually is a pericardium. Uh, yes. It's mm -hmm. localized pericardium. It comes from the USA. Uh, and it's, of course, it's a bit expensive. So maybe if you, if you don't have tutoplast and if you have sclera, it's okay, you can use sclera. Okay, thank you. Okay. And one final <laughs> question. Okay. Do I saw you have the eye, eye plate. Now the implant become, uh, came with the eye plate or you can still choose the barbell or maybe... Yeah, you can still put a barbell, but then it will be more expensive because then you have to buy the barbell plus the... So the eye plate is given uh -huh. almost free. I mean, the, the, the company Rayon gives you automatically the eye wash with the plate. Ah, okay. It's a free ah, okay. <laughs> okay. Now I understand. Yeah. It's a good deal. It's a good deal. You know, you get two for the price of one. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I have you. a question, Miriel, that, that maybe is interesting for you too. Uh, so, with all this eye watch, uh, this idea comes to your mind because uh, I think in, at least in Ahmed Balb, when you have like hypertensive uh, episode, it's a really bad we, for that uh, drainage devices. I think the percentage of failure is, is very high. So I think uh, it's kind to your mind, this eyewash to avoid this hypertensive uh, phase. Yeah, see, I, I was not happy with, with the Ahmed or the Barfeld. I also used Moltino before. But uh, ah, okay. I, I was not happy due to all the complications being mainly hypotony, it's a very low pressure. Uh, yeah. And then the strabismus and the corneal damage. So there are th three major complications. And uh, that's why I almost stopped to do uh, tube surgery. And then I, I, I decided to try to do something better. And that's how about 10 years ago, 
uh, I went to work with the people in the Polytechnical School to, to, to find something better. And it took some time. Then we work on rabbits. We put uh, many of these systems in rabbits and keep them for one year to be sure that it was really working on a long term. And then finally we got, uh, five years ago, we got uh, the permission uh, through Swiss Medic to do it in human. And uh, it took five years to get a final approval. Uh, and also we, we changed a lot of things during these five years. We changed the angle of the, the little cube, we changed the shape. Uh, so that now it's uh, kind of, it's, not, it's never perfect, but it's, much, it's very good now, I think. Yeah, I think so. It looks but really, really good. You don't have any perfect operation in glaucoma. You know, perfection doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> but it can That's do better. True. That's the aim of our, you know, I, I'm, all my life I try to do, do, do better surgery so that we developed a deep tracheotomy, uh, and then uh, now we develop this to try to do it better. But it's not mm -hmm. perfect. So uh, there's other question uh, about the price of the device is uh, how much is uh, more or less uh, the price of this device? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know the price. They will sell it because it's right new now. It's just starting to sell since two to three months. So, but we pay, I can tell you, we pay in Switzerland 1,400 Swiss francs, which is about 1,300 euro or dollars, it's 1,400 euro. Oh, wow. And we pay for the Ahmed, we pay more than that. We pay Ahmed, we pay 1,800. No. And, Bar and Barfeld, we pay a little bit less. So it's actually between Barfeld and Ahmed. So it's cheaper than an uh -huh. Ahmed. So I don't know now in South America, I guess they would have to do so, give you the price probably a little bit cheaper than a half med. But I don't know the politics they have because uh, the, the, the Rion Medical, I'm not the owner of this company, I'm just their medical advisor. So uh -huh. uh, they, they are doing the price. Uh, so I told them, don't do too much because otherwise people would not be able to buy. You should be the same price as the, as the Ahmed or the Barfeld. Uh -huh. in, in South America, it's, it's, the prices are different. For example, uh, we had the Ahmed bulk that FP7, I think it's around uh, $500 okay. or 600 yeah. And Berbelt, that now we have the other alternative that is from India. Oh yeah, that's it. How much do you so, say that? Yeah, it's, it's less expensive. So it's like, uh, I think $100 or something like okay. that. Yeah, then it's very cheap. Yeah. But, uh, but I'm sure that uh, the Rayon will adapt the price according to the countries, you know, because uh, here Switzerland is the most expensive uh, market in the world for yeah. medical device and medicine. Uh -huh. So I'm sure they will have to adapt the price for South America or from, you know, other countries where life is not as expensive as in Switzerland. Yeah, I hope so. So yeah. we can have that in the iWatch in our OR, so it will be like, Amazing to have it yeah. here too. It would be nice for people who are going to ask uh, Réon to tell them the price you pay for Ahmed Val in your country, but then they can adapt uh -huh. to the price. Because if they don't, you know, because they only know the Swiss price. And I said, but I will talk to them, telling them that, that you pay about 500 US dollars for Ahmed and 100 for Barfeld from India. And then they will uh -huh. maybe uh, find out of course, it's a very sophisticated technology. As you saw, there are all these uh, little ruby balls, I mean, inside the device with the magnet. It's really like a watch. Mm -hmm. That's why it's called iWatch, because it's a really a micro technology. So th that has a certain price. But uh, I can tell you that they can also, they don't pay so much. I mean, now they do, they do in many, they can reduce their, their production cost. And I'm sure they can give it to you for probably the same price as Ahmed. Ah, oh, perfect. Hopefully. So maybe you can send we you can so. send them my email. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please. Uh, uh, and I will talk to them. Don't worry. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. You are welcome. Uh, it was nice to for be here. for participate here. And merci beaucoup, doctor. <laughs> uh, gracias, gracias, muchas gracias. <laughs> Abrimos los micrófonos para darle un fuerte aplauso al doctor André Mervoud.
thank you very much for your presentation. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Mahmoud. Bye -bye. Uh, be safe. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. Excelente charla. <laughs> Super interesante. Increíble. Increíble. Sí. Mire, puedes poner también esa. ¿Te acuerdas de esa fotito que te mandé? Sí. Mañana tenemos al doctor eh, Juan José Mura con glaucoma infantil. Uf, y tenemos increíble. esto. Manos al ah, rescate, cruzada solidaria. Sí. Ahí está. Sí, es para todos los médicos que están eh, combatiendo el COVID eh, en algunas provincias que en realidad no tienen eh, una protección adecuada de mascarillas ni de guantes. Eh, por favor, si eh, pueden ayudar a, a todos estos médicos que en realidad están luchando por nosotros. Yes. Entonces ahí les dejo la imagen para que le tomen foto y puedan ayudar, para que salgamos pronto de todo esto. <ríe> Sería sí, bien. por favor, por favor, ayúdenos. Bueno, muchas gracias a todos los que se conectaron el día de hoy, no se lo pierdan mañana. Y bueno, gracias. Podemos poner esta foto yo creo al inicio y, y, y comentar de esto, ¿no? Sí. Eh, chévere, Mirel. Eh, sí, la, la ponemos la cierro, cierro. Ajá. Bueno, gracias a todos, un abrazo. Nos vemos mañana.